Yes, good morning friends. Today we are going to see the Norma Basalis posterior part. In our previous video we have seen anterior part, intermediate part we have seen and now we are going to discuss about the posterior part of Norma Basalis. So the posterior part of Norma Basalis which is present behind the posterior horizontal plane that we have drawn at the level of anterior margin of foramen magnum. Now one of the things we can identify in the posterior part of normal basalis. So number one we can identify a big foramen called as foramen magnum and then we can identify squamous part of occipital bone and then we can identify the occipital condyle. So these are condylar parts of occipital bone. And other things what we can identify are we can identify lateral to this basilar part of occipital bone, you can identify the petrous part of temporal bone and styloid process. So in this bone you may not see any styloid process. In this uncolored bone you can identify the styloid process here. Styloid part of styloid process and mastoid process. These two are the parts of temporal bone. Now let me explain first the foramen magnum. <coughs> so the foramen magnum which is present medially and it is 3.5 centimeters anterior posterior diameter and transverse diameter is about 3 centimeters. So this foramen magnum, this foramen magnum it is going to divide into two parts by alar ligaments. So in the anatomical position the alar ligaments which are connected which are attached to the dense means second cervical vertebrae. So the ligaments are which are extending laterally and they are fusing to this foramen magnum of the occipital bone and these ligaments are separating the foramen magnum into two parts, anterior part and the posterior part. So the anterior part, what are the structures we can identify in the anterior part are, first we can identify apical ligament. Apical ligament which is present anteriorly there you can identify sometimes only the tip of the dense extends into the anterior compartment of the foramen magnum and upper border upper band of cruciate ligaments upper band of cruciate ligament and membrana tectoria so these structures which are present in the anterior part of foramen magnum that's why it is called as osseo ligamentous canal osseo ligamentous canal and coming to the posterior part so the posterior part is called as neurovascular canal because the structures which are passing through the posterior compartment are first one is meninges and then you can identify lower end of medulla oblongata then you can identify the fourth part of vertebral artery after coming outside through the first cervical vertebral atlas and then the fourth part is passing through the foramen magnum strictly speaking it is passing through the posterior part of the foramen magnum and enters into the cranial cavity and right and left fourth parts they are going to join and forms the basilar artery. And then we can identify the anterior and the posterior spinal arteries. So you can identify that they are also passing through the posterior part. And occasionally we may see the tonsil part of the cerebellum. So that's why the posterior part is called as neurovascular canal. Anterior part is called as osseo ligamentous canal posterior part is called as neurovascular canal and the margins of the foramen magnum margins of the foramen magnum they give attachment to anterior atlanto occipital membrane posterior margin it is giving attachment to posterior atlanto occipital membrane and the midpoint of the foramen magnum anteriorly this point is called as the basion basion then coming to the squamous part of occipital bone. Let me show you the squamous part of occipital bone. So the squamous part of occipital bone we can identify from the posterior end of the foramen magnum one crust which is extending upwards and reaches to the external occipital protuberance. So in another bone I will show you clearly. So here is a basic a squamous part of occipital bone. From the posterior end of the foramen magnum we can feel a crust which is extending upwards and reaches to the external occipital protuberance. So this crest is called as external occipital crest and the projection is called as external occipital protuberance. So from the protuberance we can identify the lines, two lines which are running bilaterally one on each side. It is called as superior nuchal line and then from the external occipital crest 
we can identify inferior nuchal lines, one on each side, they are extending bilaterally. And the squamous part of occipital bone, this part, it is going to divide into two different areas. So the above area and the below area. So the above area, superior area, which is present between superior nuchal line and the inferior nuchal line. And then below area, inferior area, which is present below the inferior nuchal line and the posterior end of posterior margin of foramen magnum. So this, if you take one half, this half, what are the structures which are attaching to the crest, protuberance and the nuchal lines now we can see. So the uh, external occipital protuberance, it is giving origin to the trapezius muscle, whereas even the medial half of the superior nuchal line, it is giving origin to the trapezius muscle. Below this superior nuchal line means the superior area which is giving attachment to two muscles, medially it is giving attachment to semispinalis capitis and lateral area which is giving attachment to obliquus capitis superior, obliquus capitis superior. Then below this inferior nuchal line, below the inferior nuchal line, this area which is giving attachment to two muscles, medially rectus capitis posterior minor laterally rectus capitis posterior major. So these are the muscles which are attaching to this superior area and the inferior area of squamous part of occipital. Whereas the external occipital crest, it is crest is giving attachment to the ligamentum nuchae. Ligamentum nuchae. Then coming to the condylar parts. Coming to the condylar parts, I'm just moving, turning this. Yes, coming you can see the occipital condyles clearly. Even in this curve also we can identify clearly the occipital condyles. <coughs> These are the two occipital condyles what we can identify. Here I can show you somewhat clearly these occipital condyles which are present anterolateral to the foramen magnum. Anterolateral to the foramen magnum we can identify occipital condyles. So these occipital condyles, anterior to the occipital condyles, we can identify a foramen called as hypoglossal canal. Hypoglossal canal. So this hypoglossal canal, which is passing hypoglossal nerve and meningeal branch of ascending pharyngeal artery, these two structures passing through the hypoglossal nerve, and sometimes we may see the emissary vein also passing through this and connecting with the sigmoid sinus. And then coming to the condylar fossa. Lateral to these condyles, we can identify a small depression called as condylar fossa. Condylar fossa. Now coming to the condyles, what is the role of these condyles? Occipital condyles, they are articulating with the superior surface of atlas and forms atlanto-occipital joint. Atlanto-occipital joints. And these condyles, they are having a small projection medially. This tubercle we can identify. This tubercle which is present anteromedially. Anteromedially, we can identify the tubercle on the occipital condyles. <coughs> then, behind this occipital condyle, sometimes we can identify another foramen called as posterior condylar foramen. If you see clearly, this uh, right side we can identify the foramen called as posterior condylar foramen. On left side, we cannot see any foramen behind the occipital condyles. So, when the posterior condylar foramina are present, then only we can call anterior condylar foramina. Otherwise, we can simply call them as hypoglossal canal. In this skull, we can see two sides. Bilaterally, we can identify the posterior condylar foramina. So that's why we can call these anterior condylar foramina for the hypoglossal canals. Then coming to the lateral to this occipital condyles, what you have seen is jugular uh, occipital condylar fossa then towards lateral to the condylar fossa we can identify jugular tubercle jugular tubercle jugular process which is present lateral to the condylar fossa and lateral to the jugular process we can identify a foramen called as jugular foramen and lateral to this jugular foramen strictly speaking anterior lateral to this the jugular foramen, we can identify a depression called as jugular fossa. Now, the jugular fossa is contributed by the petrous part of temporal bone, whereas the jugular foramen, which is present between the occipital bone and the temporal bone. Okay, then coming to this jugular foramen, 
So the jugular foramina which is present anterolateral. If you see like this in the anatomical position, you can see the foramina is present anterolateral, and this foramina is divided into three compartments: anterior, intermediate, and the posterior. So the anterior compartment, which is passing inferior petrosal sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, and intermediate compartment, it is passing the glossopharyngeal nerve, then vagus nerve and spinal accessory nerve, 9, 10, 11 cranial nerves, they are passing through the intermediate compartment, intermediate compartment of jugular foramen. And the posterior compartment, posterior compartment we can identify inferior, in, inferior jugular vein, internal, sorry, internal jugular vein, which is passing through the posterior compartment of jugular foramen. So this bulb, bulb of internal jugular vein, so the commencement of internal jugular vein is Study it is present at the level of the jugular fossa. In the fossa, we can identify the bulb of internal jugular vein. In the posterior compartment of jugular foramen, we can identify internal jugular vein here. Yeah. So that is about the jugular fossa, jugular foramen, and we can identify jugular process. Then coming to the <coughs> moving towards laterally, moving towards laterally. Between the jugular fossa, between the jugular fossa and the condylar canal. So the condylar canal, which is present anterior to the jugular fossa. So this condylar canal, which is passing internal carotid artery. Between these two, between these two, we can identify a bony bridge, a bony bridge which which, which is present between jugular fossa and the condylar canal. So this bridge is giving attachment to tympanic canaliculus. Tympanic canaliculus, canaliculus is present on the bridge between jugular fossa posteriorly and condylar canal anteriorly. And then moving towards laterally, moving towards laterally, we can identify a bony projection called as styloid process. Here we can identify the jugular fossa and carotid canal here. Then lateral to this, we can identify a bony projection called as styloid process. So this styloid process induces attachment to different muscles called as styloglossus, stylopharyngeus, and stylohyoid muscle and the stylomandibular ligament. These are all the structures which are attaching to the styloid process. And lateral to the styloid process, strictly speaking, posterior lateral, we can identify another big projection called as mastoid process. So this mastoid process, which is giving insertion to sternocleidomastoid muscle, sternocleidomastoid muscle, and between the styloid process and the mastoid process, you can identify a foramina called as stylomastoid foramina. This stylomastoid foramina is the structures passing through the stylomastoid foramina or uh, facial nerve, seventh cranial nerve, and stylomastoid artery that are passing through the stylomastoid foramina. And posterior to the stylomastoid foramina, we can identify a notch. So this notch is called as a digastric notch. So the digastric notch, which gives attachment to the posterior belly of digastric muscle, posterior belly of digastric muscle, and as well as occipital artery, which is a branch of external carotid artery, it is passing through the digastric notch and extends upwards and supplies to the muscles of the scalp posteriorly. So that is about that's about the posterior part of Narma basalis. Thank you.